Welcome, we're the Macomb County Genealogy Group. You can find MCGG at our blog website, on Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter, and at our YouTube channel. You can contact us at either of the listed emails seen here. The MCGG Friday Group has been meeting for over 48 years and our MCGG Let's Talk Genealogy Discussion Group has been meeting for 16 years. During this pandemic and the library's renovation, we are meeting virtually once a month as a combined meeting. Many MCGG members volunteer their time in a variety of ways to benefit the genealogy community and the Mount Clemens Public Library. This is the MCGG Friday, an MCGG Let's Talk Genealogy combined virtual meeting, October 13th, 2021. Our topic tonight is where? Using land records and other resources to answer the question presented by Lisa Eschenberg. If this is your first time attending a MCGG meeting, welcome. Attend a meeting and you are a member. MCGG has no dues. If you would like to be added to our mailing list, please send an email to the email shown on the screen. We try to keep our emails down to a reasonable number each month, mostly meeting reminders. As far as announcements, we don't have too much to make. Um, just, you know, if you're interested to see what another group is doing, check our calendar or check directly with the group that you're interested in. Check their website and see what meetings they have. One thing I want to announce is that we've been testing a volunteer genie in a box by appointment service since we haven't been able to go into the library and volunteer. So this is one on one help with the genealogy volunteer online. You don't have to turn your camera on, but you can talk one to one with someone right now. It's primarily me and get help with a genealogy question. There's a questionnaire. Um, that I'll put the link to in the chat and you can um, fill out the information. So we got a little pre-knowledge ahead of time and we can find a common day and time to set up an appointment. It's either going to be through Zoom or if you have Gmail, we can use Google Meet. So um, this is on our G Drive and um, I'll give the link so that uh, if you're interested in having some help, you can um, fill it out. Right now, the library is still in renovation and mode, and there's no meeting rooms at the temporary site, so we are still going to be meeting uh, via Zoom. Okay, let's get started. Um, tonight, we're going to look at the question of where, and where encompasses a lot. Where did they live? Where did they work? Where did they worship? Where did they play? There are numerous where questions. These questions can be for personal family stories or even a local history sketch. So naturally the question of where brings up, brings to mind land records. But even with land records, one record type rarely tells the whole story. Land records are mostly the beginning and the end, the buying and selling of a particular piece of property. They yield some details, but not those in between these two events. And for the in-between time details, you also need to utilize other records, often related to, but sometimes more general in nature, to tell the whole story or as much as can be told without being there yourself. What type of other resources can help fill in the details? More directly related to land records, there are a variety of maps such as survey, plat atlas, fire insurance for cities mostly, historical maps showing roads and places of that time, modern maps showing roads and places currently. And this includes online maps like Google and Bing. 
directly related to the land records are tax lists and assessment books. As we move out to more general resources, directories for cities and counties, both before and after the phone, um, often help place someone where. Census can help too. Population schedules can give an address, mostly in cities and villages, and more likely later in census. And not only the snapshot of who lived there, but also their neighbors. The 1850, 60, 70 census asked the value of the real estate owned, a clue to look in land records. The 1900 and 1910 asked, did you own or rent, own free or mortgage? Was it a farm or a house? And gave a cross-reference number to the farm schedule. The 1920 pared it back down to owned or rented, owned free or mortgaged with the farm cross-reference. The 1930 and 40 asked, owned or rented, value of the home or monthly rental if rented. Asked if a farm or gave a farm schedule cross-reference. These answers tell whether or not you need to add land records to your research to-do list. When they survived, the 1850 to 1880 agricultural schedules show what was produced by the people who lived on the farm, telling you more detail. But not every farm is on the schedules. In the 1850, small farms producing less than $100 of products annually were not included. By 1870, farms of less than three acres or producing less than $500 of products were not included. The 1820 and the 1850 to 1880 manufacturing schedules can give some details on businesses making more than $500. There is an 1810 manufacturing schedule, but there was no standardized questions, if you can believe that. So quality of the info is gonna vary greatly on that census. There is a 1935 schedule of businesses, but the types of businesses are very specific, resulting in it not being as helpful for most people. Um, on the Canadian census, the 1906 asks section, town, ship, range, and meridian. For areas, um, enumeration years with surviving agricultural census schedules, you can learn the lot and the concession numbers for the township and county that the person was residing in. The 1921 census asks if owned or rented, monthly rental fee, the class of the home, the materials made, getting a lot of information here, and the number of rooms for living. Now on the UK census, starting in 1851, we get a street address or name of the house, but no indication whether the home is owned or rented. Um, the 1891 census, you get the number of room, rooms occupied, less than five, and on the 1911 census, you'll find the postal address on the second record image for the household. But again, no indication of ownership. What else can fill in the in-between? City or town township minutes can yield information on a person and or a business. Newspapers with their stories, advertisements, and photos can help. Photographs and picture postcards, both in personal collections and in historic, local historical collections, may illustrate a particular location. Letters and correspondence may yield stories of events. Books on local history may yield both photos and stories. Wills and probates may give evidence of a chain of ownership. Court records may indicate disputes in property lines or ownership. Surviving school records may link a family to a particular school covering a particular location, narrowing down the where. Sometimes it is a series of events, meaning the finding of different pieces of information from various resources that make those various pieces click together to create the answer. I have covered these various pieces of other resources first because there is a lot to land records themselves. And you know, my, myself and my handouts are usually quite long. So the handout I have created is set up as a tip sheet. Unfortunately, we may not do too many live examples tonight. I had hoped to use the Macomb County Register deed site, but the deed site was down earlier. It appeared an hour or so ago that it was back up, but I'm gonna cross my fingers on that one. 
So we'll do the best we can tonight. So I initially termed this a quick look at land records, but I think a look is a better description of some of the basics with regards to land. Most of this is in your handout, so don't panic if I go move a little quickly through this. So the first thing to remember, the grantor is the seller and the grantee is the buyer. Or as I say to myself, the grantee is the gittee of the land. The harder to remember is the mortgagee is the person or bank loaning the money and the mortgagor is the person obtaining the loan using the property as security. Now, a signer and a signee are often seen uh, when dealing with military rights to land. The assignor is the seller of the interest claim or right, while the assignee is the person or persons who bought, received the interest claim and right. I think most people who have dabbled in land or probate records know of dower and dower right, the one third to the wife for her lifetime. I've included some other common terms here and they are on your handouts. Et al. entries usually are the gems for genealogical research, but sometimes it is just business partners instead of relations, re relatives listed. Heirs is one thing that comes to mind when you see an et al. So another thing to remember is most often a deed was not required to be recorded right away. It could be years or decades before it was recorded with the county or the town land office for various reasons. Registering deeds could be expensive, especially if your farm was not doing well. Um, kind of like sometimes there was a delay or uh, in uh, recording children's births. If the farm wasn't doing well, the child may not have gotten recorded with the county. So um, let's get back to the lands. Um, the other thing is that the land registry could have been a greater distance away, making it very inconvenient. Um, I have an ancestor who sold his land, moved to another state, and before that land sale was registered by the buyer, the land itself changed states. So the buying of the land was in one state, even though the sale of the land was in the same state, by the time the deed was recorded, it was now another state. So I wasn't happy about this because while the original state was digitized and online, the second state at the time was not digitized yet. But at least at that point in time, I could order the microfilm that I needed. I wasn't happy about having to order it, but at least I could do so. So there are a variety of deed types, each vary in the level of protection for the buyer that nothing is amiss. For historical land records, you will most likely see quit claim and bargain and sale deeds. Um, along with various other types of records found in deed or copy books, such as sheriff sales, inheritance, Etc. And this is my observation based on my experience working with land records from all over the place. Um, so quit claim deed relinqu relinquishes any and all rights held by the seller to the buyer. No protection against liens or other encumbrances. A bargain and sale deed is kind of similar. It's a type of deed that offers no guarantee that the title is free and clear of debts and liens. Um, as we go along in life, the deeds get a little bit more complicated there, but they're in your handout in case you need to refer to it. So with Canadian land, land records, the terminology is similar, but there are some differences. This is where the deed books are called the copy books because they're actually a copy of the actual deed, which is in the purchaser's hand once it's written. Um, you'll more, you, you will more likely find abstract indexes in Canada, which are the indexes to the instruments and deeds for a given county and township arranged by lot and concession, the subdivision, not by person. So you have to know the property location. It's essentially a running history of a particular property's ownership history. 
There are alphabetical indexes, again, by county, and then township, arranged by the name of the parties, like the U.S.'s grantor and grantee indexes, but sometimes a location may lack these. So that's where you pull in a county or city directory and you get um, what land, the, what the lot and concession is for a person, or you check that agricultural schedule and check that for the lot and concession. Now, in the last year, maybe a little bit more, the Ontario land registry offices were closed. So all the physical buildings were closed because the land records, including the historical ones, were digitized and are now online, on, on land. Um, so this website has set viewing hours to allow the site to update for current day documents. It kind of conflicts with us uh, genealogists who like to search during the middle of the night when the internet's faster, but you get used to it and you work around the, that limitation. There might be a cost when downloading images, but in, initially uh, it appears that they've delayed that, but note that most of the early land records are digitized and available for free on familysearch.org. So you can actually use either for the really early stuff. So when dealing with land records, it all comes down to measurements. You may find a variety of measurement terms used and some are interchangeable. To understand it in today term, today's terms, you're gonna have to do math. Um, probably converting everything into feet and then backing out to acre, you know, a mile or whatever you need. So one chain, which you can see an image of on um, in the lower right-hand corner, is four poles, rods, or perches, which equals 66 feet and 100 links. So that one link that is showing there, um, here, right here, that's 7.92 inches. And this is the chain. Now, there are a variety of land division systems to be aware of, and the use of them depends on where you're on the where, your area and location. There are two types of survey systems used in the United States. Meets and bounds was used early. And once the US federal government was established, the rectangular survey system was used. Now it's actually all based on meets and bounds with um, a measuring device, a compass, and um, the rectangular system uses meridians and baselines, which is how it differs. So um, you'll see those two more often and it'll depend on the area that you're working with. In Canada, it is a similar situation. Early on, there are meets and bounds and later it became a rectangular survey system. A little bit different at first. Um, the river lot systems is based on meets and bounds, but it is a particular style of platting used by the French. So you find it in New France, which is Quebec, and in areas like Detroit, where the French had settlements. So it's long, narrow, not, narrow lots running perpendicular to and along major rivers and waterways, giving all settlers access to the water for irrigation and transportation. Now in Canada on the Eastern side, there is the rectangular lot system based on townships divided by lots and concessions. So instead of the square survey system, which is called rectangular in the United States, um, it's actually rectangular. Um, in the Maritimes area, the meets and bound system took on the name of the patchwork system because of the irregularity of the lot sizes and dimension and shapes and the way it kind of looked like a patchwork quilt. Um, the lots though were, giving, were given lot numbers according to parish and county to help identify them. Um, as, and in, 1870, as Canada's government expanded its land, it implemented the Dominion land system based on the American public land system. 
So now you've got the townships and sections on the west side of Canada. So you see it, in your handout, each system has similarities, but they are different enough that you need to pause and get your bearings. What system am I dealing with? Okay, so you need to understand the history, genealogy of a location place to best understand what records are available and how those records changed over time, where those records and where those records might be located today. I think we've all heard mention of a genealogist realizing their ancestor never moved. It was the town or township or county boundaries that moved, making it appear the ancestor had moved around a lot. So you have to do some pre-research research. Look up the history of the county formation and the towns and townships to get a handle to when and where boundaries shifted and to get an understanding of how the land was settled. Is it an area where there was colonial settlement? Is it a newer area after the formation of the United States federal government? These answers will make a difference in the land records involved. Usually a look at the location, the county usually, on Wikipedia will get you started with the history of the area. You can also use the research wiki. It all starts when a country claims land elsewhere. Then this claimed land is given or sold to individuals, usually wealthy, or groups such as religious or investor companies as land grants. The land grants were expected to make money and many were required to deliver a certain number of settlers to settle the land. This granted land was either leased or sold outright, usually in smaller parcels to the other individuals. So your handout in the next slide covers where to start the search for surviving records of land grants. Patent maps can be found in a variety of places too. The David Rumsey map collection has several of these though most are general, not detailed down to individuals. Sometimes you'll find the first sale deeds not recorded with the county or town that or that that first deed transfer abstracts rather than gives a complete boundary description. Depends on how lazy the clerk was, I guess. Copies of the first sales after the grant may still be with the papers of the individual or company, which may be at a museum, a university, a library, archive, or in private hands. It's not always simple. So for the United States, if you have really early immigrants, you may be dealing with colonial land, which involves a variety of grant types. Essentially, it is the 13 colonies we are talking about here, Connecticut, Delaware, Georgia, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New Jersey, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, South Carolina, Vermont, and Virginia. Um, a governor or proprietor that had the grant could give or sell land to soldiers or settlers. Um, original records may be at state archives. So a good starting point is the research wiki, um, looking at state land state. And each one varies in where its land, uh, you know, records are kept. So check under the state that you need and review the information. Um, FamilySearch.org, use its catalog. Um, uh, by a couple different ways. This, go to the catalog and then search the state name and then look under land and property. Or go to the state name, uh, go to the catalog, excuse me, put in the state name and the county name and then go to land and property. So what types of land situations could you be dealing with? You've got company land grants, such as the Massachusetts Bay Company. You've got individual deeds, sales of lands from individuals to individuals. So as they got here and they moved around, you know, they bought and sold land. Um, quit rent systems, which is the renting or leasing of land rather than selling it. And a good example of this is the Patroon Manor system in New York. Um, a lot of those lease the land rather than sell it, but some did sell it. 
Um, we've got bounty land, form of payment by the federal or the state government for military members. And it was also a way to expand settlement. But there's also British bounty land here too, because the British government didn't want to pay people to come back and then give them land, which wasn't necessarily over available over in England and buy them land somewhere else. So rather than move them around, give bottom land here. So head rights land is when someone pays for immigrants to come, the king gives that person a number of acres per immigrant brought over and the immigrant works off their passage cost to that person who paid the passage, who also got the land from the king. Um, that's probably more prevalent down in the Southern colonies. Um, indentured servants would work like seven years to pay off the passage over and then they get 50 acres um, and that happened throughout the colonies. Um, again, these records can be in a variety of places. When the US federal government was formed, the colonies, now states, ceded their land claims to the federal government. But the 20 colonies and states did not cede unclaimed lands within their borders. These 20 states are referred to as state land states. The 13 colonies, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. The states formed from the 13 colonies, Maine, Kentucky, Tennessee, Vermont, and West Virginia, and then Texas and Hawaii, which had a little bit different land situations going on with them. So they get lumped into the um, state land states. In these states, you will mostly see those odd shaped lots surveyed in meets and bounds. But for some states, you may also see some rectangular surveys um, also um, in what was their unclaimed land at that point. Um, use the research wiki and the catalog at Family Search to get yourself started. Now, after the US federal government was formed and the colonies now states ceded the unclaimed land, the federal government organized, resolved prior claims, um, those of that from uh, people who received the land from other governments or, and the Native American claims. Um, and then um, when they got that themselves organized, they um, set about granting and, or selling this public land to raise funds for the government. This land was surveyed in rectangular survey, again, townships and sections, which are actually more square than rectangular. Um, the states later created out of these public domain lands are referred to as federal land states. The granting of the land from the US federal government to individuals can be searched on the Bureau of Land Management's General Land Records Office website, and the patent certificates can be seen and downloaded there. The search results also indicate under what authority the sale was made. And then you can research that description to find out what paperwork might be generated. Case files for those types of sales and grants that generated them are not digitized and are at the National Archives. Okay, again, sales of this land after the initial land grant were recorded by the local land registry office of the local county. So once the person who was granted the land got the patent, um, sold it to someone else, that's a regular sale and that gets recorded locally. If the area was still a territory, you'll need to determine where those territorial records were kept. And usually it's like one of the original counties um, that were um, established for the territory. So now let's talk a little about Canada again. For Canada, use the research wiki to explore by province for the land and property information pertaining to that province. Um, for early land records of what would become Quebec, which wa were recorded in notarial records, which was organized by the person who was the notary, um, now, this is not an area of expertise for me, so seek out the research wiki for more information 
on dealing with land in Quebec. Now, a bit later, as England expanded, we find land petitions for both Upper and Lower Canada. Please note that these are not just for United Empire loyalists, those loyal to the crown during the Revolutionary War. There were many acts that encouraged settlement in Upper Canada, which became Canada West, which became Ontario, and Lower Canada, which became Canada East, which became Quebec. That's just so we all remember what became what. So to get started, you find an index to petitions at the Library and Archives of Canada. The petition images are, are at the Archive Collections Canada website and the patent plan maps are at the Archives of Ontario. The links are in your handout. For later land sales after the grant and patent, you look at the Ontario Land Records Registry. The actual offices, like I said, were closed, but everything's digitized and online. And for the really early stuff, most of it is digitized on Family Search, and you find it by going through the catalog, searching by province and county, and looking under land and property. One aspect of land I want to mention is that land is still owned and managed by Native Americans, First Nations, and Inuit, but their records may be restricted and harder to access. However, there may be copies of portions of these records held at archives elsewhere up to a point in time, such as copies made for cases of prior disputes. RG10 is one collection. Um, through the Library and Archives of Canada that I know has some land records. And I've got the links there to get you started on this aspect. So the process to search for land involving land grants may vary by the type of land grant and the location US versus Canada. So I've got a couple different processes here. Overall, you're going to determine the grant and patent involved. And that requires that pre-research research, what was going on in that county prior to my person being there. Search and determine where the records are located. Now, you may have to use derivative sources, meaning like someone created an index book or abstracted information from records. And uh, so originals may or may not be digitized, or available. If they are, you search for your person. Now, if you're dealing with US federal land states, a lot of this is digitized. So you're going to locate the land patent certificate by putting your person's name into the Glow Records BML sites search engine. And um, you may have um, a bounty land reference from a pension application, which may help you. Um, but you may not know, did they actually use the bounty land themselves or did they sell it, put the name in and you should find something. Um, you're going to determine what applications, paper, applications or papers might've been created by the process. Um, so, and then you're gonna research the method of acquiring the patent by cash or grant. Look at the authority line on the search result. That will tell you under what act or what situation, what they were using to request the land. Search for the case file at the National Archives and Records Administration if, it, if you have one. They are not digitized, so it's something that you've got to do while there or hire someone there. Cash sales generate less paperwork and information than other types of grants, so just be aware of that situation. There might not be any other papers. Now, the general process can vary um, depending on type of grant and all, grant and all that. Um, there's an application or petition made. If the board or whatever um, decides to go forward, they issue a warrant to, to survey. Then the survey is completed. Now, this may take a few years to get done. There may have been fees required to be paid. And if all went well, a land grant was issued. And with that land grant came obligations that the petitioner had to meet. 
So when um, those obligations and fees were completed, a patent, the deed of ownership was issued and your petitioner became landowner. Now, for Upper Canada and Lower Canada land petitions, you're going to search for the application and petition. And be thankful it's now and not 10, 12 years ago when you had to do it manually and nothing was indexed. There is an online electronic index to petitions. The one drawback is that the petition images are not linked. So you need to copy down the information that you have in the search result and then go to collection, the archive Collections of Canada site, which this is a direct link in your handout, and then locate the microfilm, digitized microfilm number you want. Take a look at the bottom of the image for the little tag that says what um, section you're in, and then eventually what bundle, um, and then you're going to find the actual application number. And um, it could vary from a couple pages to six or something like that. It, it, so it's gonna vary per application. Um, you will likely find the person's signature if there, or if they couldn't sign their name, you'll see an X. Now there are other records created in this process because of course, you know, there's lots of books and entries and, but they're not all digitized, especially those that are at the Archives of Ontario. However, the patent plans, which are the maps to who got what piece of land um, are at the Archives of Ontario and I've got the link there for you. Now there is also a um, PDF uh, to the research guide to the grant to patent process, which I have the link there for you too. It's multiple pages that describe the whole process from beginning to end that these petitioners went through. Now, the process to search for lands, deeds and, mortgage, deeds and mortgages is fairly straightforward. Determine the location, search the indexes. So you've got grantor and grantee, and depending upon what you know, you may start with one or start with the other. I suggest looking at both, but you know, you may know where the property is, but you're not sure when grandma or grandpa or great, great, whatever bought it. So. Um, look that way. Um, so make note of the grant or grantee, the deed volume, and the page number. That way you know, in case you're having a hard time with the writing, um, you have two names to look for rather than just one when you're searching. But you should have a deed number and a deed volume number and a page number. Search that deed volume for that page number. It may, the record may run more than one page, or it may be conveniently all on one page. Determine if it's the correct person and the land that you're searching for, if, if you know what land you're searching for. So you're gonna do that by comparing the land descriptions to confirm that it's the same property. Now to trace land backward and forward, you're gonna search the grantor and grantee indexes for the other parties and their transactions selling and buying that land. Um, so if Smith sold it to Jones and you want to know, um, if you're going to go forward, you want to know who Jones sold to, or if you're going to go backwards, you want to know who Smith got it from. So you follow, follow the trail and you're going to compare the land descriptions in each of these records to confirm it's the same property they're talking about. It shouldn't change too much unless they sold like a piece to uh, make a school or a cemetery or something like that. Now, don't forget to check the mortgages too. And you're gonna follow the basically the same process, determine the location. Now, for most states, land records are kept on the county level, but when you get to some of the New England uh, states, they're kept on the town level. So from what you know, determine where to start, the mortgage or index or the mortgagee index. Make note of the transaction details. Search out the mortgage volume and the page number. And then determine if it's the right person in the land. Again, comparing the land descriptions. And then don't forget to look for additional mortgages because your person may have lent money to someone else. 
to buy land or had to do it again because we needed to pay some bills. And um, if you can't find what you're pretty sure should be there, recheck the history of the county or the town. Borders may have moved, but the records would have remained where they were at the time. So if a large county was sectioned off to make another county, your person and their farm may not have moved, but the county may have changed. So they may have bought in one county and sold in another. And they didn't always copy the deeds over for uh, the respective deeds over for the new county. So <clears throat> that covers most of the land stuff. Um, this personal family history or local history sketch that partially inspired this presentation idea, though I thought it would be next spring before I'd be presenting this, is still a work in progress. But I can tell you about how I've researched this family story historical sketch so far. So when my family talks about Uncle Carl's bar, it finally dawned on me that we're all talking about a different place. And who's doing the talking? But then add in an antidote, wasn't there an Eschenberg bar in Waldenburg? So it can be a little confusing. So you start by writing down what you or others know. Though so not necessarily the first step early on, you need to get at least some handle on the genealogy, the who that is involved. These dates and locations will help when sorting. And so, Writing down the story or the stories will also help when sorting the details. And for me, relocating a family record relic was necessary since none of us remembered it the same way. And so essentially this came down to three situations. Second great grandpa, Fred's brother, Carl, who went by Charles, owned a bar in Mount Clements. Now I know this from my research and a co my cousin Diane's research and family knowledge. She descends from Charles. Now, I also make note that Fred moved next door to his brother when he retired. Now, that's not particularly necessary for what I need to know, but helps me keep track that I've got the right guy. Now, Carl Charles died in 1932. That's what I know when I initially started. Now, Grandpa stopped by Uncle Carl's bar in Mount Clemens. Dad was too young and had to stay outside to get paid from Uncle Paul. Bars, the bar's windows were broke out a lot, per my brother's recollection of Dad telling them certain things as they went to go pick up parts that he needed here and there. I wasn't on those car rides, so I didn't necessarily hear these stories. Um, so based on that, we figure this was likely the mid 1940s, mid 50s of when this was occurring. The timing has to mean another bar because great uncle Carl, Carl Charles is dead. He died in 1932. Now, always the faint memory is the mention of an Eschenberg bar in Waldenburg. But who owned it? Where was it? I didn't know. None of us did. So census and city directories, directories are generally accessible, so it helps to start with them. I didn't start with land records yet because for, of the third situation. I had no idea where and who was involved with it. And I wanted to kind of do this search all at one time. And with businesses, you don't have to own the building to run a business. So I wasn't quite sure if I'd actually find anything. So looking at census and city directories, I added to what I started with. I used census to determine occupations. I have no name associated with Waldenburg Bar, so I don't have anywhere to go with that. And city directories I used to determine locations. Now there's no county directories, so I'm still striking out with Waldenburg. For Carl, AKA Charles, I know that he immigrated in 1880, so his bar didn't exist before then. But I have a problem that directories don't start until 1896. But what I can learn, what I did learn, is they show us saloon or sample rooms 
with Carl as the proprietor at 38 Court Street, which became 10 Court Street when the streets were renumbered. 12 Court Street also gets involved. It was a livery and Carl owned, Charles owned it for a while. And then it says the bar is no longer at Court Street, it's around the corner at 29 North Front Street. We can estimate Charles moved around the corner to 29 Front Street between 1905 and 1909. From census, it shows he's a saloon proprietor in 1900 and 1910, but has no occupation in 1920 and 1930. So sometime between 1917, the last directory I have in that time period, in 1920, Charles retired. Now the second situation, I determined that it was Carl Christian, the fifth child of second great grandpa Fred, who lived from 1885 to 1960, who owned the other bar, the one my brothers were talking about that my dad talked about. Directories show he started off in auto accessories at 20 North Front Street in 24, 1926, 27, 29. By 1930, he moved up the road and across the street at, to 63 North Broadway, which was at one point 63 North Front Street. By 1938, he was out of the auto accessories and now had a restaurant at the same location. I don't know how, but I don't think it was a repair shop. I think it was just a part shop. Um, by 1942, 43, he's noted as liquors and wines and beer, AKA a bar. So later directories need to be rechecked. I have some of them, but I'm not sure I have all of the ones that are appropriate because I was looking for different things when I made those copies. Now the ashtray that we had, I found back and it says 65 North Broadway. Did he move buildings or was the street renumbered again? Good question. So let's go on. I then expanded my research resources more. Now remember, I'm doing this during the pandemic. The last few months, I have limited access to certain things. Maps were investigated, historical plat maps, Sanborn fire maps from Mount Clemens, allowing the placement of the bars in Mount Clemens. City Minutes via the digital archive, and thanks to De Debbie Larson's uh, transcriptions, established the earliest date so far for Charles's bar is 1886, six years after he got here. Photographs and picture postcards of the streets were found um, and provide visual of some of the locations. Newspapers digitized Mount Clemens World War I, or excuse me, World War II years, um, were looked at and proved quite valuable just using a simple surname search. Articles confirm Carl's Bar and give a doing business as name as the Rats Keller Rest at 63 North Broadway. An ad provided the first clue to the Waldenburg Eschenberg Bar or Tavern. Other articles point to a possible interview subject. And other databases such as the fire department, volunteer fire department number three runs confirmed Carl's Bar was in operation up to 1955. With some effort, I found the images for Charles's second bar and Carl's second and third locations for her, his businesses. So Charles's bar is just north of the art shop. It's this darker building and this is the sign and I wish it had been scanned at a higher resolution so I could read the sign better. And this is Carl's locations. This is 63 North Broadway, which was Front Street. And this is 65 North Broadway. Um, you can see they kind of took, oh, took care of the window problem by kind of making the windows a lot smaller. Little diamonds there instead of the big plate glass that originally was there. 
Now, where were they? The yellow boxes indicate Charles's first bar here and his second bar at 29 North Front Street. The orange boxes indicate where Carl's bar, uh, auto parts and bar were located. Now, his original auto parts store was on this side of the street down here, but that's not the one I was concerned with. These are the two that were bars. Um, now, the blue box over here is Uncle Paul's tire shop. And when my grandfather did plowing for my uncle, his Uncle Paul, he met him at Uncle Carl's bar around the corner. Now, today, uh, the, these locations were victims of urban renewal in the 1960s, and they probably did need re replacing. Today, the court building and the green space lie where the bars and the neighboring businesses once sat. I'm still working on land records. I know I haven't showed them to you yet, but these two were a little more difficult. Charles may not have owned the buildings his bar was in, and that is one reason I need to look at newspapers again. I, Carl, I believe, owned the second location, but may have run into some financial problems because of health issues. Both situations require more research. So what about the third bar in Waldenburg? The digitized newspaper ad from the 28th of July, 1944, gave me my first indication of Eschenberg Tavern on Romeo Play. There's no address. There is a slight description, um, but what I found is the Fraser ad your us did not link to anyone in particular. So not very helpful, but hopeful. It wasn't until a very recently published historical book, Images of America, Macomb Township, sparked an idea. It mentioned a bar sold in the 1940s to Walter Kling. Ding, ding, ding. Back to the digitized newspapers. And I found another ad from the 19th of October, 1945. Kling's Tavern, 4660 Romeo Plank Road, quarter mile north of Hall Road. Now there were names and a location to search the deeds and maps and census. I may not have known which Eschenberg, I should be able to find a transaction between Eschenberg and Kling. So, search of Macomb County's online deeds show that 24th of February, 1911, John Quacko sold to Christ and Augusta Eschenberg. A location right in here. It's so small, they can't get his name on it. Um, and they sold 5th of June, 1951 by Augusta. Her husband died in 1950 to Walter Kling. Now the book said it was sold in the 1940s, but it obviously took a while for that transaction to actually occur. It is the only building of the various Eschenberg, bar, Eschenberg bars to still be standing today it's Goldie Saloon today. Um, a recheck of census shows that Chris oc Chris's occupation was given as storekeeper. There was a store, a barber shop, living residence, and a bar in the back. So while I've made progress, I'm not done yet. My to-do list includes reading the early Mount Clemens newspapers for any earlier indications of Charles operating or owning the bar prior to 1886. I also need to check other non-digitized Mount Clemens papers for articles near key events, such as Charles, Carl, and Chris's deaths. I need to also review these same time frames in the Detroiter Abin Post. These were men with German backgrounds and German was spoken in the homes at least until World War I and sometimes World War II. So they likely read the post. I found an article in the 19, one of the 1915 editions in the post 
on the bars and breweries of Mount Clemens. Of course, there was a section cut out. It mentioned all the other bars, but not Carl's. I think that's where the hole is, but I don't know what was on the other side of the page, which resulted in someone clipping the newspaper. I also need to recheck later editions of the Mount Clemens city directories. While I have some photocopies, I'm not sure I have every applicable year for this task because when I copied them, I was looking for someone else. I need to also look at tax records and assessment books. This will help me. Um, I'll take questions and if needed, we'll try to do some live online, online pointing out of records. If anybody has any questions, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask or put them in the chat. Well, I'll start. Okay. It was very interesting that you told a story to make it come alive. That's it what I was originally sense. intending, but because I had to present much earlier than I thought I was going to be presenting this, I gave a lot more information up front and then got to the story. But I'm Very glad good. you enjoyed that part. Anyone else? Can be on the land records or anything. Don't um, forget to unmute yourself when you go to ask your question. I started typing this, but I'll just jump in. Okay. Um, the records that are in the National uh, Archives uh, for the land, transactions that led to the, the patents. Um, uh, for Canada or the for US? States? For the US, okay. for US. Um, what, what is the extra value of the uh, information on the petition or the background before they actually issue the grant? Well, uh, what, what kind of materials do I, what I expect to find if it's not a quick cash sale? If it's not a quick cash sale, like a homestead grant purchase, um, there is usually like a questionnaire and um, things to fill out as far as um, whether they were a citizen, if they weren't, and they are they naturalized. I mean, the questions are going to vary depending upon the time period in the grant that was used or the act. Um, so sometimes you can go online and find um, examples from other people as far as what's included. I'm not sure if anyone here has requested one of those um, case files and what they've received. If you have, let me know. Um, my people came to Michigan and kind of stayed. <laughs> well, the reason, so the reason, I was at, the reason I was asking is when I was indexing the early deeds, it seemed like the doors opened in Detroit for issuing the patents today. And, you know, about 30 people lined up and they all got their patents that day. It wasn't like there was a lot of background paperwork that occurred prior to that day. A lot um, of them in this area were cash sales. Yeah. Um, you get occasionally some that were um, um, like my fourth great grandfather sold, well, they, the family sold his bounty land um, award. So it was someone else who came in and all he did because he was the purchaser of it, handed it over, told him what land they wanted, he wanted, and then it was signed over to him. So, um, you know, it depends on, like I said, the, the, the act or the grant, what information is produced. I'm, I'm assuming the National Archives charges for the research and the paperwork. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's kind of like, what's the value in paying? For yeah, that? well, yeah. if you're there yeah. and there's something you want, then, you know, or, you know, yeah. take a look Thanks. at it. I'm not sure of the cost to if if they've got a service to to copy those case files, what that cost is. You know, a lot of they used to make a copy of a passenger list for a certain amount of money or um, they used to. Um, you could request the pension file and they charge a certain set amount of money. So I didn't get that far in researching what the cost might be, but that's something easy enough to do on the NARA site. I assume you saw my direct message to you. Uh, no, I haven't got, gotten down into there yet. <laughs> Let me take a look. You're Chris, right? Most yeah, I did time. notice the deed, deed site was up. I just wasn't sure if it would be up by the end of this. 
All right. Um, as far as Inuit, Inuit is a term for Eskimo. Um, so um, that's what they use in Canada for that. So that's the difference between First Nations and Native American and um, it's just a different term for that that they use. You know, I've never been in Goldies yet. Once this darn pandemic is over, I think that's one place I'm going to try to visit. Yeah, I haven't been to Goldies either. When I went to Macomb in the 70s, it was, or the um, early, late 70s, early 80s, it was I building <laughs> across the street, across Garfield that we went to. Well, Sharon, um, for uh, Sharon's question was how to find children who receive lamb through probate. Well, um, hopefully the probate mentions where the land is. And then from there, you look through the um, land records for that, let's say county, it was a county. Mm -hmm. And then um, you just look up their names. Now you may need to look at um, what you would probably do because it should be from the you know, whoever's probate it is, it will be either under their name or the uh, executor or the administrator's name. Um, mm -hmm. But it should say um, like um, John Smith, estate or um and then it should list what child or whatever you know mm -hmm. it should be like a smith to a smith or if it's a, a daughter um you should see the transaction that way how likely and how far back do probate records go i mean obviously it varies by state but did we keep those in the revolutionary era oh yeah okay land records are probably one of the least um ha, ha, has the least amount of loss to it now there are places where you know there was a courthouse fire or something right. like that but usually when that happened the landowners would then bring the deeds and have them re-registered into the new books um, okay so there's the, and, and it could be some because de deeds these records weren't required to be recorded right away. Mm -hmm. It may hap have happened when the person died or years later when the person went to go sell the, the land, then, you know, they registered, I, this mm -hmm. is how I got it. And this is who I'm selling it to. Okay. So would you start out with probate records? Um, yeah. See, I'm not sure where I found what I found in Virginia volunteers pointed me in the right direction, but I didn't keep as good a record as I should have of what I got from where. <laughs> I've done that before too. Yeah. <laughs> You're not alone. Um, yeah, so uh, look to see what's available digitally now. Okay. And you may, it, you may be able to figure it out from there mm -hmm. uh, without having to travel back to that location and do it again or you know I, i'd like to avoid that yeah so look to see what family search has um digitized for that area okay um, with probate you might be able to check on ancestry hmm. now so they'll have things there um but those same things should probably be on family search but they may not be available on family search because they're over at ancestry so you kind of got to jump between the two to figure out what's where. Now, the land records, I don't believe, are on Ancestry. So they're, they would be over at Family Search. And just, you know, if there's any stamps from paying or receipts for the copies that you got, take a look at them. That may help you figure that out, wh what came from where. Okay, thanks. Um, Chris asked where, where he could find the agricultural schedules for Macomb County. Um, Ancestry has some, but be aware, um, one of those years, the second page is missing on Ancestry for some reason. So go to Family Search. That's how I found my uh, mom's families. I'm looking at it I'm like, why, why is there only one page? And I checked against something in Dutchess County, New York, and there was two pages. And I 
okay, what, why is this missing? And so then I contacted Chris at the archives and asked, okay, now the National Archives says they gave the stuff to the archives here. Do, you know, you have that and is it available? And because what's on Ancestry is missing that second page. And he went and looked at the microfilm they have. No, the second page is there. And I did a little more research and found out they're also on Family Search, and I was able to get the second page there. It's different scans, which was nice because the it, Family Search ones were better than the Ancestry ones. And in an answer to Chris's second question, uh, Family Search is free, but you do need to create a uh, a free account to access records on Family Search. So, um, so here's here's a scenario. Uh, early land record indicates or one of the early patents. Uh, Mr. Walker of Walkerville fame and his whiskey brewing company over in Canada um, actually did some of the, the BLM grants and had a co-signer that I'm assuming ran the farm in Warren and actually raised the, with the hops or the weed or whatever it was and shipped it over to Canada. Uh, so I'm looking to, to see what exactly what was made on that land was, you know, what, what kind of agriculture was raised there. And, would, and hopefully the records from the Walkerville organization on what was shipped over there from, from Warren. Uh, <laughs> that's where i'm coming from okay yeah you should be able to find them on family search because i know those have the second pages i think it's just one year that's affected like that thank you very much yeah i have a question that's kind of off topic and it's directed to christopher werner who's in the group here are you in any relation to herman and gloria werner no i am not nor okay. am i related to the other 50 werners in the state according okay, to just, the voter records. Just checking, because they have a son named Christopher, and I wondered if that was you. No, okay. I, w I went to school with a couple of Werners and oh. a couple of good friends, but the, my, my, my parents uh, mainly came from overseas, so. Okay, thank you. It, are the renovations at the library on schedule, sort of? Or do you have any guesstimate as to when they might be done? heard of any delays i'm looking to see if Teresa's is still here i don't see her I, I know she had to leave at some point um as far as i know everything's okay um i know they're they were still working on the plan but there was a delay in getting some materials but i haven't heard that that has delayed anything further we get all the questions in the chat okay i think we did I'm gonna share my screen again. All right, let, let me minimize that so you can see better. All right, so this is the Macomb County um, Clerk and Registers of Deeds page. Can everyone see that? I'm assuming you guys can all still hear me. You're coming through loud and clearly. Okay, so. great. Yes, yes, I can hear you. I, I, I can't see the, the Zoom stuff. <laughs> All right. So you click on register deeds and you click on search, deed search options. And basically the first time, you know, all you really need to do is go into basic search. And click the accept. You used to have to submit a um, credit card number before, but they don't have that anymore. So ju they just notify you that it's $6 per document, but you know, go through and just do a search first, look for what you're looking for, and then count up how, if you're gonna buy something, how many different pages are you gonna buy? It may be cheaper to go back out and use um, the, uh, the advance because there's some options for, there and it, there's a 24 hours for $25 and then the cost of the, each document is only a dollar. So, you know, but do yourself a favor and just search first, see what you want there. So you go into document, now you can search either party or do the grantor or the grantee. Um, you can limit your recording dates um, to narrow it down. Um, 
the more modern documents have a document number. Um, if you know a volume and a page number, you can jump there. Some of this advanced search stuff does not necessarily work in basic, but basically you're typing in the name And I'm going to adjust this again. And I know it's, what was the date? All right, we're gonna narrow it to there. There we go. So it will bring up a results list. Assuming, you know, I just did a, the general search and not specifically for what I was looking for. You can narrow it down by type of record. Um, if you've got multiple listings, um, narrow it down by grant or grantee. Now to see what you're looking for, you view. So it comes up with the image, it's going to be fuzzy. That's on purpose, so you purchase the record if you want it. But the information is abstracted on the left here. It, this one has been given a document number, um, the recording date, um, what Lieber and what pages. Lieber is volume. Um, it spells out who's the grantor, who's the grantee, it gives the legal description of the land, and there's part of it that says C instrument. You will see that occasionally, and it gives the document date. Now, the type ones are a little easier to read. The handwritten ones are a bit harder, but I'll show you a way around that depending on the age of the document. So we've got the information that's been abstracted, Walter Kling made the purchase. Um, as you can see, this is $1 and other good and valuable considerations. Um, I'm not sure, I know we're related to some of the Klings, but I'm not sure if Walter was to Augusta. That's a different branch of the Eschenbergs, which is a little more foggier in my mind. This gives the description and signature, and then the second part continues the document. Some of these later ones are usually just one page. So from here, I can enlarge it if I need it, need to. Um, I can switch the pages easily enough. Um, you go to print or download, that's where the cost is incurred. So I'm not gonna hit either of those buttons, but you can see it's relatively easy. Um, to operate through here. Now you can, I'm going to go backwards. Um, in the search, you can um, narrow it down to a certain type of document. So as um, in our last month's meeting, one of the per, uh, one of our members mentioned that um, with a lot of the more modern documents, um, you can get deaths, there's death certificates attached and you can narrow it down to seeing just those, probably past it, but it's in here. So you could do that. I'm not gonna do it for privacy reasons, but um, you can do that. And uh, depending on um, where the death was, um, you could pay $6 for that page um, to get a copy. The other option that I will mention that I will not mention is uh, you can take a screen capture if needed. Okay, so that was the county clerks, um, which is a nice, fully searchable website. Now, for those earlier documents, you're going to go to Family Search, create an account. Um, if you don't have one already, go to Catalog. Accounts are free. I'm gonna put in Macomb, Michigan, because over here, the records are by, count, uh, by county. 
Now, if you get to Connecticut, New Jersey, uh, or Connecticut in particular, the land records are held by the town level. So you'd have to go into that. But unfortunately for Connecticut, you have to be in a family search affiliate library or a family history um, center um, to actually see the documents. Uh, and I've given you some, uh, uh, an alternate route depending on that. So under Macomb, land and property, go into D, you're gonna look for register of deeds, town clerk, whichever way you're going. Um, and you're, that is going to be the original records. If you get like an author, that's a book. We don't want that in this particular case. So there's deed indexes that you can search. Um, but as you saw, if you use the clerk's office, you get an electronic search. Um, there's a mortgage index. Now let's just show you, now the deeds index goes up to 1907. I go into here. I, what I did is I right clicked and open, had it open up in a, another browser tab. That way I have breadcrumbs back to where I was. <clears throat> what I'm going to do is just jump, go to a page and enlarge it. Um, there's some tools usually in here somewhere that you can adjust the image, brighten it up, add some contrast whatever you need to make it more readable for you, okay? Uh, so what you're seeing here from Macomb County in this time period, grantor index is on the left. Grantee index is on the right page. You get lever, page, and not always, but nice here, tells you the section, the town, and the range. And that's one visual clue you can use. No, that's not who I'm looking for, if you know where your person is. Um, so you can download these index pages as you need them and uh, then take time later to write it out or just visually use it as a guide going down the page. I looked at this one, I looked at that one. Um, so, Basically, you then look for the volume you want and the page number. So back over here at our breadcrumb, after the indexes, you'll see a couple books where it's deed and mortgages together. And then you will see deed records <clears throat> and the, time, the year range. Now, H and I are here. So there's two books in this section. And deed records go up to volume 90, which takes you to 1900. Click on the camera and see the camera. You've got to be signed. And I'm just going to pick a page. I was going to write down some searches, but I wasn't sure if this was going to happen. Um, as far as using the county clerk's site. So um, these are one page deeds. Now this is, because this is a clerk's copy, this is not the person's actual signature, usually. Um, and then you see the land description and the, the grantor to the grantee, the dates, it's fairly simple, then download the page you want and you can use Photoshop or something else if you just want the one page instead of both, <coughs> excuse me, left and right. So to find it for other counties, you're just gonna go back to the catalog. Let's see, mortgage records go up to 1887 for Macomb County. Some counties go further, some go less. Just go to the catalog and then type in your state and your county or your province and your county. <clears throat> now for New York, 
don't know how many of you have um, ancestors that bought land on the western side of New York. You go into New York State itself. Uh, land and property. <coughs> the Holland Land Company records were microfilmed and have been digitized. And so you get an inventory up there. And then um, there is a book which I've listed on the handout um, that is at Mount Clemens. And you might be able to find it at some other local libraries. Um, it is the handout, Western, <clears throat> it is Western New York Land Transactions, 1825 to 1835, extracted from the archives of the Holland Land Company. So if you have someone in that book, you can look to see the actual document. This was one document where in the county that first deed after they bought it from the company only referred to the deed from the county. It didn't, the, the clerk was lazy and didn't record all the information in that second deed that was with the, um, the county. So I had frustration in trying to figure out where are these Holland Land Company records and how can I access them? So that's that. One other thing, um, whoops. Okay, so we did Macomb County, showed you looking at the deeds, uh, showed you New York, we've been through the county clerk. The other one I can show you, hopefully it's working, is, okay, here's the, BML, Bureau of Land Management. And I know we've talked about this in Let's Talk many times. You can change it. You can narrow it down to a state or just say any state. Um, so I'm gonna search up the cousin, or uncle, I should say. All right. Oh, now there's more. Okay, wasn't fully operating earlier. So I'm going to look at this result. I think that's the one I want. And this authority right here is how Ephraim purchased the land. And so it could say, uh, um, a grant or an actor, you know, that's going to tell you. And then you take that information that um, and see if any case files would have been generated. So this is the actual patent certificate. In this case, um, it's his widow and his children who are, and then the, he's deceased. Um, and then it has the land description and that Martin Van Buren signed it or the person signed it for Martin Van Buren. And so you can download this and save it for your um, genealogy. So that's how that works if you haven't by chance already operated this website. The other website that hopefully I can show you once I figure out where it is. No, I don't think my link saved. Well, I should be able to get to it. So um, this is the Library and Archives of Canada. You will find it occasionally goes down on the weekend for updating or whatever. I'm going to click on Ancestor Search, and these are all the various records that they've got digitized there. Land petitions for Upper Canada, meaning Ontario, are found here. There's the land board there, too. 
read the about this database. And then you can search the database. And then it gives you the results. It tells you the place involved, the year, a volume, a bundle, and a petition number. You need this information. And then you need the microfilm number because this is, an, is not a linked record. It's not going to take you to that volume bundle and petition in, in um, the digitized records. So click and make a new tab and archived. These are the microfilms involved, digitized. So we're looking for 2049. It bounces around a lot. So you click on it, it opens up. Now you can view it as JPEG or PDF. To me, the PDF is a little easier to search through because it, it's on the page. It's not flying off the page and you have to go look. So let me enlarge this a little bit. This is the little tab you need to pay attention to. This tells you what bundle number, what letter and bundle number you are in, the time frame, and the volume. All this information here that you need to know where you are. H13, we're in the right. So uh, I don't remember what page number he's on. I'm just going to jump. So this is 82A. I thought it was 135. Yeah, it's 135, but I don't remember the image number that I'm looking for <laughs> where I prior found this. So let me go 400. I don't want to waste too much time jumping around because any of these will show you what we're looking for. Um, so this says Q. So some of these have more pages than others. And you can see this is a petition, particular one in the petitions. A variety of people. Uh, okay, so we're at 120. Let's give it a shot. And then we'll just go through it. 131. I think that's a seven. Thirty-two. All right, it'll work. So you get a front cover, a you know, piece of paper. Then you get the petition. You read through the petition, and then if they could sign their name, it's there. Um, if they didn't, there's an X with their name. And what you also want to there's another page for this one. Um, what you want to also pay attention to is the folded outside portion. A lot of times the commission wrote notes on here um, regarding whether that was accepted or not um, and, and going through there. So that's kind of the tips I wanted to make for this particular site. Now, the other one I wanted to briefly show you and not seeing it in my tabs. All right, the um, Archives of Ontario is where the plan maps are. Go to access our collections, scroll down, digitize patent plans, put in, in the search. Um, thank you. You're looking for something like this. Click on the image, click full-sized, and then see how the magnifying glass has a plus, click that. 
you can download this so you can look at it a little easier online but by lot and concession and all these names on here are the persons who um, got the patent or they may have had a lease it will say lease um see the deeds it's gotten a so that's what that looks like and why isn't it not letting me go left and right that's sometimes why it's easier to um, download it and some of the, these things canada company bought it so that's how you find the plans um the other one, I'm going to have to do it the old fashioned way. <clears throat> All right, so this is on land. Um, and what you want to, whoops. Excuse me, that's not on land. There we go. There. This is on land. And to look at the old stuff, you're going to click on historical books. Then you're going to type in a land registry office. There is on their help page, there is a video and a handout you can watch or look at. Um, I just want to browse all books. Sometimes that's easier. The abstract or parcel register book is that running um, general register, non-land specific documents like wills and things like that. I know it sounds like our general register, but that isn't that. It's not the name index. It's the other documents. Um, so I'm just going to look that way. I don't want... Just really just want to show you what it looks like. Um, next page, next. Sometimes they're typed, sometimes they're handwritten. So what you're seeing here, and I know this one is kind of blurry, you can find them on Family Search also. Basically, it tells you which lot and concession you're looking at. And then the very first one is the one that got the patent. And then when they sold it, who it went to, and so on and so on down the list. And I really wish that was a better page. Let's jump there and get, get a little idea of how it looks. This is a type section. And then we're back to sloppy. So that's kind of how you would look through it. You're going to, once you learn the lot and concession of your ancestor, you're going to look for the township. And then this is lot one. And it will tell you the concession to also up here as to where you are. And if it continues on, you'll see that it'll say, see whatever page. Okay, any other questions? You had one come in the chat from Diane back right after you did the clerk's office. Is the process okay. similar for Detroit or Wayne County for the clerk's office? And yes. I'll let you answer it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's basically the same wherever you go. It just depends. Like Canada, you have an abstract index. You may not necessarily have a grant or grantee index. But I, over in the U.S., you have grant or grantee indexes. Right. But no, we're talking about the county clerk is do you have any experience with Wayne County's? No, I do system? not with the Wayne County <laughs> clerk, because what I need is usually historical and that is usually on family search. Yeah. And one one note, although many more several more counties have digitized their their land records, Macomb County was the first county in Michigan to be fully digitized. So yeah, and what's kind of really got it nice, really good. <laughs> and what it's really nice it's it's electronically indexed yes like on land here the records are all there but for this old stuff you got to manually search mm -hmm. um but it's a different scans than what's at family search so like for that old stuff you know you may 
jump back and forth between the two. The same with Macomb County. You look looking at old stuff. You can do the electronic search, find the volume and page number, and then move over to family search and go directly to that deed book and locate the page number you want. I just wanted to add um, for those that were familiar with the super index of a couple of years ago, and then it went to the land records. Um, they just completed their installation of this new system and it's a product which is used by many municipalities across the country. So the time you invest in getting familiar with the tool itself would pay off if you're researching in a lot of other areas of the country. Right. It's, it's a much larger market. <laughs> yeah. Yes. All right, I'm gonna stop my share. Any other questions? We can open it up to other than, you know, land and the records we've been talking about if you need to. I, I have a question if it's not too late. No, it's not too late. Go ahead. Um, since I since I forgot, even though I intended to attend that entire thing, I forgot about it, of course. Um, I've been trying to access the website for Macomb County Death Index. That I it, it's changed. It has changed? It's yes. And I can a different show URL? Um, well, no, it's a different way they do it. Just a second. Um, I'm looking for a 1979 uh, uh, death. Uh, by chance, obituaries? So at the clerk's website, you're going to go into Macomb County there. Clerk. Macomb County Clerk. If that is that the county where the death occurred? Yes. You, you were having a problem? Okay. So um, we're going to go into, I think it's still under genealogy, um, death records. You can click there for death records. And there's the Macomb County death search. Now it looks different now. Where where is it? <laughs> okay, let me back up. All right. So I went into home. There's different ways to get there. We know we're dealing with genealogy, so I'm going to click on the genealogy. You see, there's information about births, deaths. I clicked on the death records information page. I scroll down and it mentions Macomb County death record search. Okay. I click there and you know that search engine that we did for land records? Yes. It's the same search engine. What is, uh, that, search, what is that search engine? Family search? Uh, it, it's the death record index search, but it's the same type. It used to be just a simple search and it would all appear on the page. You know, you, know, like you could put in a surname. So it's kind of the same thing, but it's presented like how the deeds were presented. So you type in the last name, and if you need to type in a first name, what it would do is then give you a list, and you can just select the main surname to see them all, or look for the first name that you're looking for. Then click the search, and they is will- it only, Is it only a death date, or is, is it obituaries? Um, let me put in, oops. Well, it's going to have nothing to do with obituaries because it's oh, just, yeah. a, it's an index of the death certificates. Okay. okay. I was being an optimist. <laughs> oh, no, no, it's not all linked. So That's you select the person's name and it will give you the similar information that you got before, the date of death and... Right. You know, that's basically it. If you need to search for obituaries, you're going to go to the Mount Clemens website. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Then you're going to go to under genealogy, Macomb history and genealogy databases. Where? Okay. Genealogy, 
Okay, Mount Clemens Public Library's website, you can Google that or okay. type Mount in www.mtclib.org. I'm not, and, not, I'm, oh, M-T-C-L-I-B. Yeah, you're going to type in this. L-I-B, I'm finding it now. Okay, .org. Okay. And then you're going to go to the genealogy tab and scroll down to the Macomb History and Genealogy Databases. Okay. Okay. That takes you to this I, page. If I, if I knew about this website, I'd forgotten about it. Um, you knew about it, but it's changed probably since. It changed about a year or two ago, somewhere in there. Okay. Okay. So the second database listed is the Macomb County Obituary Database. Oh, that's what I need. Yes. Yep. And this is the one created by our members. Yay. And it's still that's being good. created by our members. So then you're going to put in the surname. You can add the first name if you want, and you'll come up with a list of what's, a, what's available. Not every single paper is indexed yet. Dwayne's working very hard on that. I think, it would have been, others. I think it would have been the Macomb Daily. Right. And this is Macomb Daily. This includes the Macomb Daily and its predecessor papers. And Great. so what it will give you is the paper. So MD is Macomb Daily. It'll give you the year, the month of publication, and the day of publication. It's not the death date or anything. It's the date the obituary appeared in the paper. Okay. Now, right now, um, they're not able to answer letters very much. Occasionally, they can answer something, but um, you know they're they're still dealing with you know COVID situation. But um, so you can get yourself prepared and ready, and then when they're ready, they'll let us know. So this so is they're not so they're not filling requests um you can or yeah most of the time they aren't occasionally they can it depends um but officially they're they're not filling requests yet filling requests for what obituaries and other requests for genealogy for, for doing the research or for providing copies of it both but we um, dialing in should be able to uh, find something. Yeah, you can use the database and you can find the, um, the information like I just showed you there. Um, so the database still works here. Yes. Um, so you'll get the information that you need, but they may not be able to fulfill the request to make a copy. Or a copy of the obituary. Right. It all depends. Yeah, you know, I can't say they can do it, and I can't say they can't do it. It's just it depends. But officially on the on the website, they're they're not answering um, requests at the at the moment. But by dialing in remotely, can we see the obituary? No, because no. no, nothing is. Digitized. Okay. Okay. That's what I need to know. Yeah, it's, all, it's, it's all in microfilm. It's, yeah, it's all in microfilm unless it's the war years, World War II years. That's digitized. Okay. <clears throat> Lisa, this is Connie. Can I ask a question? Sure. Thank you. Hey, um, I I you know, I to I totally I was working on um the funeral home uh digitizing the obituaries pre-COVID. Are we still doing that? Was it Diane that it was heading that one up? Um, no, that was Gail heading oh, that Gail. one up. Yeah. yeah. And um, is she still doing, are we still doing that? Yeah. She's still working okay. away from home. <laughs> okay. Well, you know what, then I'll start back up. I think I got Bueller all done at, before COVID. I totally forgot about it. It's just, and I'll get work and I have, she assigned me another funeral home too. So yeah. Um, do you still have her email? I think I do. If do you don't email me and I will email it to you. Okay, perfect. I'll, yep. I, I, I thank you. 
I sure do miss our in-person meetings. I know, I know. I know. Yeah. Everyone does. <laughs> I know. Um, this is for Sandra. Um, uh, there will be a massive update in the obituary index in a couple weeks. Oh, I great. mean, thousands and thousands and thousands. So if you don't find your person when you search, check back in a few weeks. <laughs> I we'll will. They'll announce it when um, that, that database has been updated. Oh, thank you so, so much. everyone knows. Thank you, Ann. You're welcome. Hey, Lisa. Uh, Lisa. Yeah, go, ahead. go ahead, Dwayne. Uh, I got a bunch more to turn in. Uh, but anyway, what I was saying is uh, your Eleanor Kling is my first cousin once removed. So. Okay. <laughs> Dwayne, you're related to everybody. <laughs> yeah. Everybody in the county. <laughs> I just have to see, see if the right. cling is part of the clings that are related to us. Lisa? Right now, I'm, oh. I'm working on uh, Mount Clemens Daily Leader right now. Okay. Okay. Is Dwayne. I have uh, the thumb drive uh, from Teresa. Okay. I have another one for you. Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> they have to go um, on this end before they go on the master. Very good. I'm researching clings. My maternal grandmother was a Kling. From uh, County? Uh, she came from Pennsylvania to Wayne County. Well, we might have a connection there. <laughs> we'll talk. <laughs> yeah. Lisa, I wanted to say I miss our face-to-face -face meetings too, but thank you for who all got involved in making Zoom possible. I second that. <laughs> and this is, you know, trying to do it by phone just wouldn't work. No. no. And this really, really is at least a sort of connection. Yeah. And um, we can thank the Mount Clemens Library for offering uh, their Zoom services to us for these meetings. And that's why I generally thank them at the end of all the meetings. Um, I didn't prepare slides for this meeting, so I will add them at the end of the recording. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Yeah, plan that's not moving very fast. <laughs> well, you're right. The last few weeks, you've been, you've been the main person working, so. Yeah. Thank you very much, Lisa, for all your efforts tonight. It was very informative. figure out December. <laughs> We've got November. Oh, I was in the process of pulling that one up. Hang on. Um, okay, Beverly Bishop is presenting next month on November 10th, War Year 1943 in Macomb County, using the Macomb, excuse me, using the Monitor Leader newspaper front pages will follow the big stories our ancestors lived through from January to December, 1943. This includes German spies, gullible waitresses, Japanese Americans, hanging, shootings, war bonds, Nazi submarines, and the home from coping with rationing, gardens, home permanence, and recipes. Should be an interesting talk. No pressure, Bev. But everyone enjoyed her talk last time, so yeah. we're pretty sure you're going to enjoy her talk this time. All right, it's nine o'clock. Nine oh five. Nine oh five, yeah. So I think tonight's meeting is over. Um, now I mentioned the. Um, I'm going to make sure I get this in there before. I mentioned the um, volunteer genie in a box service, but I'm not sure if the link to it got put out there. So I'm going to make sure everyone in meeting. 
paste there. I have just sent that link out into the chat. If you don't know where the chat is, scroll your mouse to the bottom of the Zoom window and you will see right just about in the center chat with a air balloon. Um, click on that. It will appear generally on the right hand side of your Zoom window. And it's the last uh, chat thing in there. Just copy it or click on it, copy it, and um, then uh, paste it into an email or something so you've got it saved. Or write it down. <laughs> so it, it asks a series of questions about what you need help with and um, that lets the volunteer be prepared to help you and give you suggestions. Not They're not gonna necessarily do your work for you, but they will give you advice. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening and a good week. And um, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you and good night. Good night. Welcome. Good night. Thank you for watching. Our next meeting is scheduled for November 10th, 2021. For our November meeting, MCGG's Beverly Bishop will present Warrior 1943 in Macomb County. Last but not least, MCGG extends its thanks to the Mount Clemens Public Library and its staff for hosting this Zoom meeting. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>